Hi guys, it's me, Professor Dean. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering celiac disease. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm gonna ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. You're gonna love it, so press that like button now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already and press that red notification bell so you'll be notified every single time a new video is released. Don't forget, I'm now offering Next Generation NCLEX reviews one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions, and one-on-one -on -one consultation sessions. You can reserve your spot right now on nexusnursinginstitute.com. And while you're there, be sure to check out the audio lessons I have available for you. Don't forget, almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics on my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. All right, without any further ado, let's get started. Celiac disease. Look at the first thing it says. Celiac disease is an autoimmune disease. That means basically the body is attacking the body is harming itself okay it's an auto autoimmune disease characterized by damage to the small intestine mucosa from ingesting wheat barley and rye so with that being said we already know the patient that has this kind of disease should not be ingesting wheat barley or rye Celiac sprue and gluten sensitive um, enter enteropathy are other names for celiac disease. So when you see those two terms, they're talking about the same thing. They're talking about celiac disease. It says celiac disease is most common in people of European ancestry. That's important to know. High risk uh, groups include first or second degree relatives of someone who has celiac disease, people with disorders associated with the disease, such as migraine and myocarditis. Let's look at the clinical manifestations of celiac. Look at that first word, classic. Remember I taught you, whenever you see that word classic, you see hallmark, you see cornerstone, you know you're going to see it on a test somewhere. So you better know this. The classic symptoms of celiac disease, that tells us whenever a patient has celiac disease, we expect to see these types of manifestations. What do we expect to see? Foul smelling diarrhea, statorrhea, that's fat in the stool, flatulence, they have got a lot of gas abdominal distension and, and malnutrition and intensely pruritic. So they could have just told you pruritic, which is very itchy, but they put that ver that verb, that adjective intensely it's to describe. So they're letting you know, not only is it itching, the itching is really, 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 really bad and intensely itching pruritic uh, vesicular lesion called dermatitis hepatiformis is sometimes present and occurs as a rash on, you know, the bottom, the scalp, the face, the elbows, and knees. Now, before I go further, let me make this clear. When it comes to celiac disease, the whole problem with celiac disease is that the patient cannot um, uh, digest, they cannot break down gluten. Okay. Matter of fact, before I go to the clinical manifestations, let's jump over to where it says genetic link. Cause I don't want to skip over that. I don't know where my highlighter is, but this is important. So it says about 90, 95% of patients with celiac disease have human uh, leukocyte antigen, HLA, that allele, and the other five uh, to 10% have the HLA DQ8. Let me go down. So look what it says. It says, as with other autoimmune disorders, tissue destruction that occurs with celiac disease is a result of chronic inflammation. That chronic inflammation is happening because of the byproduct of that gluten not being broken down. You'll see that in a second. It says gluten contains specific peptides called prolamines. Partial digestion of gluten releases the prolamine peptides, which are then absorbed into the intestinal mucosa, okay? In genetically susceptible individuals, remember the people who have the HLA allele, right? So in susceptible and genetically susceptible individuals, the peptides bind to the HLA DQ2 and or the HLA DQ8, and that activates an inflammatory response. It's a chain reaction. So let's see what happens when the inflammatory response happens. If that inflammation causes a damage to the macrovilli and brush border of the small intestines, ultimately decreasing the amount of surface area available for nutrient absorption. So that will cause the patient to be malnourished. They'll have decreased nu nutrients because they're not able to absorb other nutrients that they should be able to absorb. 
Okay. So that's important for you guys to understand what exactly is happening in celiac disease. All right, let's keep going. It says protein, fat, carbohydrate absorption is also affected. Patient's going to have weight loss, muscle wasting, and other signs of malnutrition. Iron deficiency is very common, iron deficiency anemia. The patients may exhibit lactose intolerance and the need to refrain from any lactose containing products. Inadequate calcium and the vitamin intake can lead the patient to have bone density, decreased bone density and osteoporosis because obviously you need calcium to make your bones strong and you have to have vitamin D in order to absorb the calcium to keep the calcium in the bones to make the bones strong. So if the patient's unable to absorb those vitamins, we're gonna see those types of disorders. It makes sense. Look at the diagnostic studies and interpersonal care. It says that celiac disease is confirmed by a combination of findings from getting a history from the patient, doing a physiological exam, getting blood from the patient, doing a serology testing, histologic analysis of the small intestine biopsies, actually taking portions of the mucosa of the small intestine to test them. You're going to have the patient complete diagnostic testing before starting a gluten-free diet. And here's why. If you have that patient start a gluten-free diet and you do that testing, the testing is going to be it's going to be skewered, right? So you're going to test them first, then go ahead and start that gluten-free diet because we don't want anything to alter the test. Now, look at what it says here. It says, let me go down here a little bit for you. It says that a gluten-free diet is the only effective treatment for celiac disease. Notice that word only, nothing else works. So a patient that has celiac disease, they cannot eat anything that contains gluten. They have to be on a gluten-free diet. Why? Because they cannot absorb the protein that normal humans, you know, that I'm saying normal humans, you know what I mean when I say that, but normally we can absorb, right? They cannot absorb that uh, protein gluten. So they have to have a gluten-free diet. So when you see foods being offered that says gluten-free, you know, they're made for people such as those who have celiac disease. Most patients need to maintain a gluten-free diet for the rest of their lives. Why? Because they don't have um, what's necessary in order to break down the gluten. And so now they got this massive inflammation throughout the body and it's going to keep happening. It's going to keep destroying the mucosa. It's going to keep causing the patient to not be able to absorb important vitamins and nutrients that they need. And it's going to physically harm them to the point that they may die if that malnutrition is bad enough. So you have to be careful. Individuals with celiac disease have increased risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and GI cancers. You need to refer all patients with celiac disease to um, a dietitian. You're going to teach them to stay away from foods that contain gluten. They have to stay away from wheat, barley, oats, rye, Although pure oats do not contain gluten, wheat, rye, barley, they can have products that, you know, are either fillings or in the milling or in the milling process that contain gluten. So the patient has to be very careful. You're going to teach them to read all labels of medications and food. They need to know where they can purchase gluten-free foods because remember, they can only eat foods that do not have gluten in them. So Lastly, guys, I want you to take a look at this table. And most importantly, I highlighted the types of foods that the patient absolutely must avoid, and you have to teach them to stay away from them. They have to stay away from baked goods, including muffins, cookies, pies, stay away from barley, stay away from bread, including wheat bread, white bread, potato bread. They have to stay away from flour, gluten stabilizers, oats, pasta, pizza, bagels, rye, wheat. They have to stay away from all of these types of foods if they want to remain healthy in that regard. Also, there are a list of foods that they are allowed to eat. So make sure you take a look at that. And I guarantee if you're going to, if you have a test coming up on celiac disease, you're going to get at least one test question on foods that they need to avoid. So make sure that you're familiar with this list. And guys, that is the end of this video. Please let me know what you thought about this video. Let me know what you'd like me to teach you next and in what format you'd like me to teach you the information. Would you like it in a lecture format, such as me teaching out of a book like I did today? Would you like it 
in an activities fun format such as the cahoots or would you like it in a question and answer format such as the videos that I release every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you so much for watching this video and before you guys log off please don't forget I'm now offering next generation NCLEX reviews. I'm offering one on one consultations and one on one tutoring sessions. You can reserve your spot right now if you go to my website nexusnursinginstitute.com and while you're there at the website don't forget to check out the audio lessons that I have available for you. Thank you so much for watching this video and you guys will catch me on the next video.